So House of the Dragon really did have a perfect start for Season 2, Episode 1 in a lot of ways, but there is an asterisk to that statement. Fans who have read the source material are going to probably feel disappointed by the last 10 minutes of this episode, or just downright confused about how they feel about it because it is presented so much differently than the source material. But this episode is so much more than that, and I don't think it is ruined by an ending that's controversial to the book fans. And we're going to go over all of that, but first, let's talk about the opening scene, and we'll go from there. I was actually very pleased to return to the North with the voiceover from Cregan Stark. Once you hear the musical score that we heard from Game of Thrones during the scenes with the Starks and reminding us of the entirety of the world of Westeros, suddenly we're back in a very familiar place. The scene between Jace and Cregan Stark really helps add perspective that the Dance of the Dragons is fighting for more than who sits the Iron Throne, but also who rules the Seven Kingdoms. Well, at this time, six if we exclude Dorne. But also, by inserting this at the beginning, it reminds the audience of the Pact of Ice and Fire. While you could call this fan service for those coming from Game of Thrones, because I don't believe Cregan Stark will appear again in Season 2, it also calls us back to the first episode of Season 1 and Viserys sharing with Rhaenyra the Song of Ice and Fire. It does suggest that this is still very much important and how they tie that up toward the conclusion of House of the Dragon could be very interesting moving forward. This next scene didn't really excite or wow me, but it does establish a few things about what is going on at Dragonstone. If you're familiar with the book Fire and Blood, you know that Daemon is not originally in Dragonstone at this time, but with this change, it does give us a more informative insight to the Blacks. Currently, their leader, Rhaenyra, is gone searching for Luke's body so she can properly accept his death. But what I do like is that we get to see a slight tension between Daemon and Rhaenys. I believe Rhaenys does have some colder feelings toward Daemon after Lena's death in Season 1, and on the other side, Daemon questions why Rhaenys did not destroy the Greens when she had the chance. The reason I like this is because it introduces the idea that the Blacks are not entirely a united front. This is a messy conflict ahead of us, and even those that supposedly are on the same side certainly do not share the same perspective on how to win this war. We'll see this later with the Greens as well. Daemon is the rogue prince, and he wants to act on every impulse or idea he has, while Rhaenys demonstrates the restraint and patience for the Blacks. It'll be interesting how these two opposite lines of thinking evolve and contradict each other as the series moves forward. Now, we do finally get a shot of Rhaenyra here looking upon Storm's End. This scene establishes little other than a way to allow us to picture Rhaenyra going through the process that Rhaenys had just described as essential. It's okay, it shows a distraught Rhaenyra, but that's about it. We'll talk about Rhaenyra here in just a little while. Now, we get up to speed with Corlys, and while there is very little excitement here, this will feel like a much more vital scene upon rewatches. House of the Dragon casually introduces Alan of Hall and makes mention of his brother as well. Now, I don't want to spoil anything for those who haven't read the book, but I will say this is very important, and although it's making some changes from the source material, I think introducing Alan Hall as someone who saved Corlys at sea is a little more compelling than how Alan and his brother are first introduced in the book, at least in my opinion. I guess I can't say much here really other than you'll want to come back to this scene in the future. So one quick complaint I do have is that we see Vagar arrive in King's Landing. Now when I first saw this, it led me to believe that Amon had not returned home since killing Lucerys. And maybe that's true, but it doesn't really matter. Everyone for the green seems to be aware of what happened between Amon and Lucerys, yet it is never brought up as a point of contention or celebration. This is different from the book where Amon is met with harsh criticism from Alicent and Otto, while his brother, King Aegon, celebrated Amon with a feast. Now, I'm not nearly as strict about my desires to have fire and blood adapted scene for scene as I am A Song of Ice and Fire for Game of Thrones, but this was a moment that I went into the episode expecting as necessary for the audience's understanding of the Greens and her disagreements, and we still get a lot of that, but we don't get this moment of Amon's return, so the lack of this scene does disappoint me a little bit. 
Now we see Aegon come looking for his son Jaehaerys, and we'll definitely talk about Aegon here very soon, but I love the consistency with Helena. She's as unusual as ever. When she states she's afraid and her overall temperament, Helena's character picks up where she left off in season 1, and when she speaks of fearing the rats, we should know from experience that something dreadful is coming. Now I will say, Helena is not like this at all in the book, but she's not truly characterized as anything in the book, so I have really liked this change. However, this particular interpretation does create a dramatic change in how this episode ends compared to what we were expecting from the source material. So stay tuned until the end to discuss that. But nobody really listens to Helena, and I'm wondering if this changes here moving forward. It's something I'll be paying very close attention to. So I appreciate this next scene communicating or rather confirming fan suspicion that Allison and Kristen are romantically involved, but other than that, I actually don't like anything else about it. I'm no prude or anything like that, but the scene reveals this secret to the audience in pretty explicit framing, but I think it undercuts an already weird ending to the episode, and we'll get back to this at the end. Aegon. I love everything about this depiction of King Aegon, from him wanting to bring his son to the small council meeting, to his desire to be appreciated by the small folk, his obvious lack of knowledge or experience as the person who sits the Iron Throne. Aegon is simply imitating what being a king looks like because he was never prepared. I love that it shows Aegon as someone recognizing his unlimited power as he basically controls Tywin Lannister like a puppet for his son Jaehaerys, almost just for like amusement. And later we see Aegon as someone unwilling to recognize his power over his grandfather and hand Otto Hightower or his mother Alicent. And I think Tom Glenn Carney demonstrates both sides of this perfectly. I heard great things about his portrayal of Aegon going into this season, and if episode 1 is any indication, I am not disappointed at all. I look forward to making a dedicated video to Aegon here in the future, but one thing I really like is that there is this scene with Aegon and Lair Strong where it calls into the spotlight that inner conflict that Aegon has. Aegon is balancing what he thinks a king should be without any experience while taking conflicting guidance from Otto Hightower. Laris essentially stokes those flames that are already burning for Aegon to assume his authority over the kingdom as he sees fit. I'm excited to watch how this all collides moving forward. Will Aegon act on his impulses, or will he continue to keep an open ear to his counsel? We shall see. But I really love what they're doing with this character, and I love how his role is being acted and portrayed by Tom Glenn Carney. Now piggybacking off of what I just said about Otto trying to control Aegon, this is true of Alicent as well. And it's not just Aegon, as Aemon is also, as Otto described, the most powerful force in the realm. The Hightowers have been striving for a really long time to be in their current position so that they can control the realm through their counsel and guidance. But like Viserys says in Season 1, the idea that we control the dragons isn't an illusion, and while that's true for the Targaryens and their dragons, it is becoming true that it's only in an illusion that the Hightowers can control the Targaryens. Ever since Aegon the Conqueror united the realm, Westeros has become the Targaryens. They own this entire continent. The Hightowers can sit next to them, but they'll never truly be one of them. We see another example later in the episode when Otto confronts Aemon for conspiring battle strategy with Kristen Cole without the king's knowledge, but it's more about the fact that Otto is not being consulted. We're beginning to see some dissent within the Greens, just as we did with the Blacks earlier. Rhaenyra, okay, now I want to get back to Rhaenyra. I think it's fascinating that Emma Darcy really only has one line in the entire episode, and it really speaks to the non-verbal communication that we're able to get out of this character. Nothing needs to be said. We may not be able to fully understand what Rhaenyra is going through, whether it's just grief or additional guilt, as well as shock and confusion. A Stephen King quote I've always loved is that, the most important things are the hardest things to say, and in this situation it may be impossible to vocalize, but it is essential moving forward. Because if you recall, before word of Lucerus' death reached Dragonstone last season, Rhaenyra seemed to be leaning into a much more diplomatic approach. The rage and desire for violence by Daemon is not shared by Rhaenyra. However, now in a relatively short period of time, Rhaenyra has endured the death of her father, she gave birth to her stillborn baby, and then the death of Lucerys. Mind you, this all came within a single episode, episode 10 of season 1. 
So when we see Rhaenyra now, she's not only different than the teenage girl we met at the beginning of season one, but she couldn't possibly be the same as she was even at the beginning of episode 10, season one. Just one episode ago, if Rhaenyra were to be given any dialogue, it'd have to be absolutely perfect or run the risk of cheapening her grief. So when Rhaenyra finally delivers her only line of the episode, I want a Targaryen, the simplicity of her words and the tonality of conviction releases the buildup of agony, heartbreak, and anger. It's not necessarily poetic and it's not trying to be. It was simple, but it hits like a hammer. It's Rhaenyra's declaration of war in a sense. But more than anything, it is human. It was the only way she could express how she felt, and when the words came out, her expression seems to be fighting between the satisfaction of stating her desire for vengeance, while simultaneously accepting a war she did not want. Now Daemon being the blood of the dragon interprets this in a way that assumes permission to move forward with cold-blooded revenge. As Daemon watches Rhaenyra walk off, I think this is very subtle, but he appears to be pleased almost. Rhaenyra might just finally be seeing things his way, but I'm not so sure he's reading this correctly. And we'll get to that. But before we do, I want to explore my personal favorite moment in the episode. For me, this was the emotional high note, and I found it to be so grounded in humanity. And that is when Jace returns, and it is such a brief scene. Jace approaches Rhaenyra. He informs her of the report from his expedition to the Vale and the North to gather allies to their cause. Rhaenyra and Jace both are wearing their grief on their faces while they try to remain strong and focus on the report. Again, limiting Rhaenyra's dialogue makes this so much more impactful. If you've ever lost a family member, especially an immediate family member, I think you understand this. The first time you see someone who you know truly understands the weight of that loss or they've experienced it too, just trying to say any words as they break apart in your throat as they do here for Jace really pulled at me emotionally. Jace is trying to stay strong enough for the moment, but the facade only lasts so long. The moment is too much and he needs his mom and his mom needed him. For me, it seems like this that only the visual medium of theater, television, or film can really offer. Also, I do like that we're given this additional scene with Alicent as she lights the candles for her mother, Viserys, but especially when she lights a candle for Lucerys. It speaks to Alicent's compassion and better frames her as at odds with the cold nature the Greens have toward the Blacks and plays well cutting back and forth between Alicent and Luke's funeral. It'll be interesting to see how this develops moving forward, especially after the ending scene of this episode. So let's get into what I think book fans might be upset about, and I've avoided most comments, videos, and reviews so that my opinion is not tainted. All right, so the white worm does reappear in this episode, and I'll be honest, Masaria is going to be difficult to really get a good understanding of as we move forward in this show, but as she's presented, she seems to simply be a power for the small folk, but more important than that, She's a voice connected to the small folk. Her plots and schemes ultimately backfired on her in season one, and now Daemon views her as a traitor. Now, when I read Fire and Blood, I understood it as Daemon plotted a revenge with essentially Masaria as the mastermind that has it executed. In the show, Masaria, I think, only offers insight about the rat catcher who will later be known as Cheese. Honestly, I really don't find it very significant, so this small change is okay, but I am curious what exactly they're planning for Masaria and the show moving forward, if anything. Maybe she'll become another Quaithe. Who knows? Also, I don't like her line about everything being transactional, and somehow that absolves her of conspiring with Otto Hightower. It sounds clever enough, and maybe neutral even, but just because she was paid does not contradict the fact that she participated in the process of usurping the crown, and she knew what she was doing. If you felt at all like I did watching this episode, right up until about now, I mostly had a very high opinion of the episode. But then, a City Watch member and a rat catcher made me wish I had never read the source material and just went into this as blind as possible. Blood and Cheese is one of the most sinister acts that occurs in the book. It's not on the level of the Red Wedding or anything like that, and I don't know why people say this. Don't let anyone tell you that. There's far more political strategies in all aspects of the Red Wedding, while Blood and Cheese is actually just pure evil revenge. First of all, realizing that the Ratcatchers are essentially given free reign over the Red Keep is kind of crazy, 
but the way it is framed works okay in House of the Dragon. Now, the first time I watched Blood and Cheese walk through the throne room without anyone stopping them or any resistance at all, that just seemed absolutely crazy to me. But on second and third watches, my mind has changed on this just a little bit. I think it is more of a statement about how nonchalant and inadequate Aegon is as king. I mean, him and I guess his friends are just lounging on the throne getting drunk and telling jokes. It's absurd. It felt like it was some high school kids drinking beers on the hoods of their cars in some abandoned parking lot on a Friday night. But what really gets me is when they finally make it upstairs and you realize that the scene we got in the book is going to be nowhere to be found. For one, there's no Maelor that has been introduced to the audience, which is Aegon and Helena's third and youngest child, which is an important distinction because in the book, Helena is forced to choose between the death of her son Jaehaerys or her son Maelor. So since we have no Maelor, obviously this needs to be changed. Another change that I'm a big fan of is the characterization of Helena. She appears to be a dreamer or someone who experiences visions, and she's odd in that it seems she can't articulate them in a way that anyone will take seriously, or everyone is just straight up ignoring her. I think her reaction in this scene is spot on for her bizarre character in the show. I know a lot of book fans were probably expecting something very visceral, and I'm sure for show only fans, they did experience that in a way but something feels like it's missing. A pop that you get from a horrified scream. In the book, Alicent is also present. In fact, the scene takes place in Alicent's chambers as it was custom for Helena to bring her children to see their grandmother every night and the rat catcher Cheese knew this somehow. But the identity and know-how of Cheese turns out to be cut from the show and that classic horror scream is missing too. I think a lot of fans of the book are going to see this scene as anticlimactic. Also, when Helena takes her daughter Jahara with her to Allison's chambers, it is revealed that Allison is in the middle of having sex with Sir Kristen Cole. Now, this would have made up for the lack of scream or reaction in the moment when Jaharis is killed, but there's no shock because it was already revealed to us that Allison and Kristen Cole are romantically involved. So the showrunners kind of ruined the surprise here. My conclusion of Blood and Cheese in the vacuum of the episode is not disappointed, but it is confused. I don't hate it because I think this moment really fit well with the character Helena, but I also understand that this felt like a huge moment that book fans were anticipating that was so different from their expectations that they'll have a negative opinion about it. In the end, this episode felt much slower paced, and I really like how we were able to jump into different parts of this world from scene to scene. Much like earlier Game of Thrones episodes, things don't linger for too long. I like that this episode really felt like it wanted to take its time, and it helped extinguish concerns about a rush pace considering that this is only an eight episode season. Each scene seemed to matter for reasons I described earlier, but it also really focused on character perspective in each scene and not just the situation. Other than the character Masaria, I felt each character really picked up where they left off in season one, but I also think Masaria was given a soft reboot to her character, which in my opinion kind of felt needed. Her scenes with Daemon felt more humanized and intimate, and I think that's an important change of pace for this character if they intend to further her plot moving forward. The standout to me though was Aegon. When he's anointed king in season 1, it truly felt that he didn't care, but when he was embraced by the people in King's Landing, I think that triggered a switch for the character to try, even if he is inadequate, to rise to the occasion and role as a ruler, yet we can still see that his careless nature is still very much present. After the death of his son, I'm very excited to see how they continue to develop Aegon moving forward. Every scene in my opinion, felt necessary other than the first scene of Alicent and Kristen Cole, but I'm kind of going to chalk that up to HBO putting their signature of gratuitous sex into their content. So how do I rate it? The best way to describe it, I thought it was a great episode mostly that had just a couple of odd choices and an ending that made me wish I had never read the source material. I'm very excited to read your feedback in the comments, and if you want the real blood and cheese story, check this video out right here.